Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elder, past, and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I also pay my special respect to all the fallen heroes from Spring Revolution in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And at last, not the least, all our participant and general presenter and our commentator, Dr. Tong Hong Shui, and everyone who are watching Zoom video from different part of the world to join the AMI seminar today. Our AMI president, Christopher Lam, will open the meeting. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, May Chair, and I won't say very much now because we need to get straight into it. But we have two very good speakers for the topic today. Uh, in the notice about this seminar, we said an incoming government because we didn't, of course, know who would win the election or how that would work out. But we now know what's happened with the election, and we know that uh, Senator Penny Wong is now the foreign minister as well as the leader of the government in the Senate. And she's been very busy. She's been in Washington and since then in the Pacific. And one of the fruits of her diplomatic efforts seems to be available for us now to see, which is the Pacific Island Forum deciding not to proceed with a region-wide agreement with China over security issues <laughs> and other issues in the Pacific. And that's something that her diplomacy seems to have pulled off very well. Let's hope she can do the same sorts of things for Myanmar. As for Myanmar, uh, the plan to send a new Australian ambassador has been withdrawn and the government is now sending, or the previous government said it would send, a charge d'affaires. From what I can understand, and, and Tung Shui may know more about this, of course, by, than me, is that the, the current government has decided to continue with that plan and the person who was to go into Gangon and become the charge d'affaires in the embassy, the, the acting head of mission, if you like, will still be going in that capacity. The Myanmar military have threatened various forms of retribution, but not specified what that means in their statements about this, but I suspect that nothing will happen and that the new person will go in, and I'm told that will happen quite soon. Anyway, Tirang Shui may have something to say about that when his time comes to comment, but we will start with a presentation for 15 minutes by Janelle. Uh, she's well known to, I think, everybody here, she knows Myanmar better than anybody else here, except maybe Chong Shui, maybe, <laughs> because she's been there so many times and she knows so many people, and she's such a well-versed commentator on the politics of the country, as well as its humanitarian needs. Chong Shui, I first met when he was in the School of Public Health at the University of New South Wales, and he was the man who developed and ran most substantially the program called Football United that brought young people together in villages and communities that were torn apart by war or disaster. And now he's the representative for the National Unity Government in Australia. And he lives in Sydney, but he goes to Canberra a lot. Janelle, you have the floor for 15 minutes and Tong Shui will follow you for 10 and then we'll have questions and answers. Thank you very much, Chris. And I'd like to begin by associating myself with the acknowledgement um, made by May and also acknowledging the fallen heroes. And um, I come from uh, the land of the Bunjalung Nation, the Wijbal Waibal people. That's where I live. And um, uh, I just want to say that Dr. Tunong Shui does know more about football than I do, so I concede that point, <laughs> which is a great um, for someone from Myanmar and also in Australia and even where I live. You know, we're football soccer mad up here. <clears throat> um, but look, what I I'll begin by saying that uh, what I've been asked to talk about tonight. I'm not talking as a member of the government. Obviously, I'm not a member of the federal government. I'm a state member of parliament, long-time member of the Labor Party, been active in policy for decades within the Labor Party, 
and so I speak with some um, uh, knowledge and background, um, obviously, about the Labor Party. But can I just say that um, the new foreign minister, Penny Wong, is um, like she's classy. And I will feel particularly uh, proud having her as the foreign minister of Australia. And um, as Chris said in his opening, we've already seen some of the fruits of her diplomacy, her whirlwind diplomacy, which has happened just within, you know, a week um, of doing that. What I want to talk about is what I observe that we may see from a Labor administration, particularly within foreign affairs, and more engaged, more robust, more what I call war-gamed, and DFAT to have a more rightful role in foreign policy. Over the years, I've seen DFAT be relegated to not leading in foreign policy. It seemed to come out of primarily out of the Prime Minister's office and often through the National Security Committee. And of course, with foreign policy, there are national security considerations, um, but that's not the whole nexus or the whole being of foreign policy. And, um, and uh, the former foreign minister, with whom I've been a friend for a long time, um, Senator Payne, I never able was able to see her really come into her own in the in that portfolio. I did liaise with her well on Myanmar and um, quite often, you know, privately and kept that relationship going all the time. So I just want to say thank you to her for her role. But I'm talking about how I see things being played out. That um, And DFAT was clearly, uh, how would I, the best way I can say it, it was sidelined. And what that does to an institution, it actually does something to their institutional capability to act in certain ways. Australia has never been particularly um, robust in the area of second track diplomacy, which is what we see a lot of, particularly in the region, and uh, quite a few of us are engaged in it. I'd like to see them more active in that area. And, and and just also being and having a stronger presence on Myanmar. Look, there is a Myanmar um, task force, and I think quite a few of us here interact with the Myanmar task force. We do that regularly, and that all, you know, is very engaging and good, and, you know, we have a say. Um, but I would like to see that more of... Uh, scenario planning around different things um, to do with Myanmar. <clears throat> One thing that I would like to I, I observe is that uh, a federal Labor government will want to be an active and a good international citizen. And that means um, being uh, more to do with the human rights issues. I mean, all administrations take up human rights issues, but some of those at the centre of what they do, albeit within the national interest. And I don't think we'll see any more of, you know, all that nonsense about negative globalism, whatever that meant, and all that sort of um, brouhaha that went on in the previous administration. And one, one other thing that I'd like to say is we won't see um, lies to friends, particularly our French friends as well. So we won't see anything like that under um, the Labor government. Now, I'll talk specifically about Myanmar. And expectations are high. I've already been lobbied, as some of you would have been, by so many people with so many projects, so many issues. <laughs> Just in the last few days, I'm sure Dr. Tunong Shui has been deluged. Well, so have I with so many different things from friends of Myanmar, from Myanmar people, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so expectations always have to be managed. I always say, you know, 
shoot for the stars. And if you have a moon landing, that's pretty good. Or go for the Rolls Royce and end up with the mini minor. But we have to manage expectations because we're not going to be able to do everything on Myanmar that we, who are so committed to it, might want. But some of the things that I would hope we would see is some more meetings with the NUG counterparts, <clears throat> starting with the foreign minister and some of the other counterparts. Uh, sanctions. Um, we've already seen uh, Labor and Senator Wong and others, and it was Senator, then Sen uh, Senator Christina Keneally, um, talk about sanctions and the Magnitsky sanctions. So we could expect to see um, action in that area. Um, I'd like to see a smaller team beyond the DFAT Myanmar task force be able to be in a conversation with the foreign minister. I know she's got a lot of demands and I don't mean meeting every day or every week, but just a smaller group, um, for want of a better word, like an eminent persons group or an engaged persons group who are very engaged in Myanmar. And I know that we'll continue to work with ASEAN. I see that it will be um, a more focused, a more engaged working with ASEAN. Yes, there's a five points consensus, but there's a lot more than that that needs to be done. I hope we don't continue to be in that twilight zone of the border aid and that we just get on with the business. I know some aid has gone in on the border. Hope we just get on with it, business as usual. I would hope that we see development assistance directly and to supporters of the democratic actors. Because we, we have this endless conversation about humanitarian aid, which is really important, humanitarian assistance, it's really important for development assistance to go to the democratic actors so that they can do the job that they do, which is the peaceful democratisation work. Really important. And I've been in enough um, uh, governments and with Labor and everyone to know we've done that going back as far as ANC, where we did give support to development assistance to the democratic actors for the peaceful activities. I would hope that we can review some of the visa situation because people are in limbo and um, also give some, allocate some more on the border as well, <clears throat> um, humanitarian. I would um, expect that we would not countenance in any shape or form the elections that General Minongline is um, concocting. That's the best way he's sort of stolen the mandate, or not the mandate, but stole the elections in 2020 by not allowing the, um, uh, the, the parliament to meet and now concocting an election in which um, he's saying it's proportional representation, therefore, you know, that's a better system, blah, 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 and more inclusive. And um, it, it worried me when I saw India and um, China meeting the SAC Union Election Commission and India goes, going so far as to say it would help break a stalemate. Well, it's not a stalemate and the election <laughs> won't, won't break what's happening now. So um, hopefully that will be very clear and strong in <clears throat> not accepting. The people won't accept it. No one else should either. And I hope that we consider um, the presence of our police. I know I get told all the time, we all get told it's to do with the transnational crime and the trafficking of women and girls, but I'd like to see that considered really seriously. Also, looking at Thailand and <clears throat> working in a very, in a closer way with Thailand. John Blacksland always bangs on about this, rightly so. And that's one area where we can do that. We have good relationships with Thailand going back to 1919 when we signed the ILO convention together, but they're old relationships that we have there, utilise those. Look, there's more, but there's some of the things that I would hope to see. But overall, it's just more engaged more robust, 
more direct engagement around foreign policy, but particularly with Myanmar. We've always been seized with it and hope that, and not, uh, not hope that that will continue. I'll certainly be driving that forward. With parliaments, I'll touch on parliament. Parliaments can do a lot. And firstly, we've got the reports from Parliament, the Joint Standing Committee, Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. I think there was a J. Scott one. And clearly they set out some actions for government to consider and hopefully they'll be taken seriously. I have seen on Senator Wong's website where she talked directly um, on this particular issue. I hope that that can happen. One other thing that parliaments can do is they can pass a resolution, um, even refresh if they've already passed one, parliamentary chambers support and solidarity with the elected MPs in Myanmar. They condemn the military coup, etc., call for the cessation of violence, all of those things. They agree to have the CRPH as the interlocutor for Myanmar, as the IPU has done. The IPU reaffirmed that in its March meeting at their governing council, and it said they reaffirmed in solidarity with the people of Myanmar and as a symbolic gesture, the IPU should continue to consider the parliament in exile, the committee representing the Pidong Sulutho, as the IPU's interlocutor for Myanmar and invite it to participate in the deliberations of the IPU in its non-voting observer capacity until such time as there's a fully-fledged parliament in the country. And that gives us from the parliament a really solid basis to work. There's 178 parliaments worldwide. We in Australia, and I get Australian MPs are busy, all parliamentarians are busy, they can reach out, utilise the IPU, utilise that very important decision of the governing council of the IPU. They can also reach out to other parliamentary bodies, even IPA, and they can talk to them. They can say some of their expectations, share. They can ask, they can in Parliament ask their government to create or strengthen the G to G to G relationships with the NUG. They can also establish a Friends of Myanmar CRPH MPs group. I know in the Australian Parliament there is a group. It can be a very specific group established with the CRPH, which represents the Parliament of Myanmar. They can invite the CRPH to address the Parliament. So there's many things that the Parliament can do to draw attention, to give solidarity and support, to actually ask the government of the day to do all of these things. And those things can be done with what I call minimal effort. I understand Parliament extremely well. I understand the demands, the dictates, the needs, how busy they are. So I try and make it as short circuited as possible. So there's much that the parliament can do. In fact, the parliament can lead in those ways. So there's two things, and I've talked about what I expect to, how I expect to see the government acting and what I would like to see from the government vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar and also with the parliament. I think I'll stop there, Chris just because my voice <clears throat> and chest may not hold out too much longer in speaking. Thank you, Janelle. You've done wonderfully. Your voice held out very well. And if you've been able to hold some of your voice in case there are questions you can answer later, that'll be good. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, before handing the floor to you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Tong Shui, I'll just mention that we sent a letter of congratulations to Senator Wong after she was named as foreign minister. And in that, we included reference to the parliament and the importance of maintaining parliament to parliament contacts with the, CA, with the CRPH, as well as government to government contacts with the NUG. And uh, I think that that point will come over well. What we will do with the parliament, once they've elected their committees, mm -hmm. is see who the chairs are of the various parliamentary committees. 
the, the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade is one. There's also the subcommittee that looks after foreign affairs, the job that was held by uh, Dave Sharma mm -hmm. in the last parliament. And we'll see who the leaders of those committees are and we'll write to them. And we also, because of our reference in the letter to Senator Wong, to the Parliamentary Friends as a useful institution, we will uh, see how that's constituted, if it is reconstituted, and I hope it will be, after the election. Dean Smith was re-elected, the Senator from Western Australia, yes. who's one of the co-chairs, and he's very useful to us in that sense. And we'll see what happens to the other co-chair, Peter Khalil. But I don't know who we're going to lose to ministries and those sorts of positions with the government changing. But there will be... A we'll big, know tomorrow. There will be a lot of changes. Well, we'll know who's the ministers, but we won't yet know, I guess, who they're going to name as the, as the prospective committee chairs. Mm. That's true. And so we'll have to get into that as well. So now to Dr. Thomas Shui, just something that Denise said that made me think of you and the Myanmar population in Australia. I don't know whether any of you are people who watch the Landline program on ABC television, but the, the most recent uh, Landline, which I'm sure you can get from ABC iView, has got a segment on, a, on five Chin families around Coffs Harbour. Uh, who are working? Did you, Joanne has got her fingers up. You saw that. They, uh, it was really very, very beautiful. These families and the way they've settled around Coffs Harbour, they mm -hmm. wear the way they're working with the local community. It's a very beneficial little program uh, for Burmese refugees in Australia, and it's worth seeing if you ever have the chance. Dr. Tom yes. Shrey, sorry, uh, they came to Lismore and gave flood donations. I've met them all. Have you? That's lovely. That's lovely. The whole I thought, community. That, that's lovely. Yeah, they, they looked a really good family, of, a set of families. They were great. Okay, Tong Shui, your turn. Okay. Ten minutes, please. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Janelle, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, from my point of view, before I present, I would like to uh, share the progress at my end. So to strengthen the existing engagement between Australian and NUG governments and also the two parliaments, CRPH and Australian parliament, I'm going to establish NUG representative office in Canberra CBD area on 15th of June next month. And then three NUG ministers, Dr. Zemao, Dr. Liam Sakao, and also Human Rights Minister Uang Miu Min, they are planning to visit Australia, but I have to discuss with the Fed and other officials for the arrangement. So that's, I'd like to share the news. Uh, regarding the, the newly elected Australian government and Myanmar affair, I fully support uh, Janelle's point. And then I really love three key words that Janelle mentioned, more engaged, more robust, and more focused. So in terms of uh, what a newly elected Australian government can do for Myanmar, I would like to highlight four key points. The first one is recognition. So in terms of recognition, I do think two foreign affairs ministers, Senator Penny Wong and Dr. Mao, if they are able to meet virtually first and then make the public announcement together, and they're mentioning about the, what Australian government's looking at the Myanmar crisis with new, uh, brand new eyes. And also if Australian government able to receive the visit from the NUG minister, that will be really great. And that will strengthen the engagement between two countries and also two peoples. And then regarding another recognition point is related to ASEAN five point consensus. So you may aware that last Friday, the Friday last week, 27 of May, ASEAN Special Envoy to Myanmar, he, he made a, a closed session briefing to UN Security Council member. And then according to the media release, according to the media release, the Special Envoy President, what he is doing for Myanmar is like, like a lift service because there is no uh, visible progress since 
he was appointed as a special envoy to date. And then a few weeks ago, I was involved in the, uh, the negotiation process of the ASEAN AHA Center and UN OCHA. UN OCHA contacted me to organize a meeting between UN OCHA and then the NUG Ministry for Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Management. Then OCHA presented about the assessment plan for the humanitarian assistance program. And then NUG, and we all understand that the, all these uh, humanitarian assistance programs under fully control of the SEC, NAMA uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian Task Force, led by uh, SEC Minister Kukulai. And then no one from NUG and also the ethnic uh, arms organization, KNU, KMPP, and Chen Nation Front, they didn't accept the SEC control humanitarian uh, assistance program. And that is why they released a statement today. So Australian governments, already, especially the labor leaders, the, the Senator Penny already mentioned that the Australian government is going to review the current policy support for ASEAN Five Point Consensus. And then Australia is committed to uh, a new standard approach. So I think this is the best time for Australian, newly elected Australian government to review the ASEAN Five Point Consensus implementation and then how Australia can support to move it forward. And second point is humanitarian assistance, including a refugee. So we are talking about uh, refugee intake. So previous government already increased the limit to 2000 and then Myanmar diaspora community and also and, and you think that Australia can increase the limit to certain more, much more than the 2000. And then not only the uh, permanent resident status, this uh, humanitarian protection program, Australian government need to consider the non-resident temporary protection visa for the Myanmar refugee in India and also Thailand. So in this sense, Australian government need to approach Thai government, and also the Indian government, because the refugee in that two, these two countries are really uh, best situation because of the, the host government policy on the refugee situation. And also the regarding the regional affairs. So Senator Penny Wong already mentioned that, that Australia going to increase influential power in the region and that they strengthen their diplomatic uh, efforts. So I do have an idea that we all know US, EU, UK, and some ASEAN member states are increasingly engaging with the NUG and then expressing their understanding on what Myanmar people want. On the other hand, Chinese government is increasing supporting the junta that created the Myanmar crisis. And then we all know that the Chinese government had a lot of national interest on Myanmar. So I do think there is a win-win-win solution in Myanmar if Chinese government is able to understand the situation correctly and then the, understand the will of the Myanmar people and the support NUG, the Myanmar crisis will be over very, very soon. And that, and when I look at the Australian government, especially the Labour Party, Australian Labour Party has a really good relationship with Chinese Communist Party. So if ALP and then the Australian new Australian government able to liaise and mediate and able to get the Chinese government to understand on Myanmar situation and then stop supporting the junta, but supporting the NUG and resolve the Myanmar crisis, there will be a success of the Australia diplomatic efforts and also the to expressing the Australia influential power in the region. So that will be the win-win-win solution. So uh, I'm not sure about Janelle and then the media, um, this, uh, participant, how do you think this idea is feasible? 
So these are the points I would like to mention, just commentary, and then also uh, just a, a question on how do you think this uh, Australia rules in mediating between the NUG and Chinese Communist Party, Chinese government. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we will now move to questions and answers. Uh, there's one question which has come forward about how the Czech Republic will take over the presidency of the Council of the European Union on the 1st of July. And the question suggests that perhaps it would be possible for Australia and the Czechs to form, to build some kind of joint initiative, which could, and the, this idea could be presented to Senator Wong. Uh, before giving you the question to answer, I just note that we had some discussions earlier about the Czech Republic because it hosted, it, it has allowed the NUG to open a bank account in, in the Czech Republic. And that's a very interesting thing and from the point of view and your office to way, this bank account must be an interesting precedent for what might be able to be done when you set up your office in Canberra. Do you think there's any scope, Janelle uh, and Dun, for a bank account, for uh, not a bank account, for anything together with the European Union Council uh, for Australia to follow? and that the Czechs might be able to help make this happen. My mind, look, I don't dismiss anything, but my mind's going to, you know, where's the nexus? Um, <clears throat> where's the commonality? Um, and I know the Czechs have been wonderful. I was with the Czech ambassador the other night in, in Dili, and I thanked him for what the Czechs are doing <laughs> on Myanmar. Um, so, look, I don't dismiss any idea at all. Um, it could be put forward. But one of the issues I was thinking of and to do even with the parliament was reaching out more to the EU and to the ASEAN grouping and the South Asian group and all of those groups. But that's from the parliament reaching out to the... EU groups. <clears throat> okay. Uh, John Ashway, the, uh, the NUG has had a lot of contact with the Czech Republic over this bank account issue, if not more. Do you think there's any scope for doing anything with the Czechs here? Have you got the Czech ambassador on your appointment list, for example? Uh, thanks, Chris. So for the moment, I do not have a from our discussion and communication between the ambassador of the Czech Republic here. And then, but the Czech Republic is supporting Myanmar, especially NUG, a lot. For example, providing, endorsing the existence of the NUG representative office in Czech Republic and supporting to open a bank account in Czech Republic. And also, Czech Republic government endorsed. NUG representative office ability to uh, support visa issue of the Myanmar citizen in Czech Republic. So some Myanmar students in Czech Republic because of their involvement in uh, CDM, civil disobedience movement, their passport was uh, revoked <laughs> by military junta. But NUG representative in Czech Republic able to endorse their passport and then make them stay legally in the Czech Republic. So NUG receive a lot of uh, support from the Czech Republic. So for me here, I'm working virtual, I running virtual office for almost uh, nearly one year, but now I'm going to open a physical office in Canberra. The next steps, I'm going to request Australian government foreign affair uh, ministry to endorse existence of the NG office in Australia. That is why I established a physical office in Canberra. Second, if Australian government endorsed my office, existence of my office, the second step is to set up a bank account in Australia under the name of the NUG representative office. So that will help a lot for the other NUG function, for example, collecting donation from the the Myanmar diaspora community in Australia and other 
collaborating agency for the humanitarian assistance, so this sort of thing. So yeah, so these are my plan related to my office, assistant of my office in Canberra. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very good. Uh, Can I just add, Chris, it's not to do with Myanmar, but when the South Sudanese set up their bank account, I helped them do it in Australia. It took a while. That was early days. And then they uh, they um, sent me a donation and I sent it back because <laughs> <laughs> I nearly died. Oh, where did this come from? <laughs> yes, I understand. It was, yeah. People, yeah, it was the whole movement of the government in exile. <laughs> yes. So I've been through those bank accounts. I know what it's like setting them up. It's tricky. Good. Now, uh, we have with us Jamie Parker, who's a member of the New South Wales State Parliament for Balmain, which I think, Jamie, is fully within the Prime Minister's electorate of Granger. Is that right? Would yes, I've got the pleasure of having both Tanya Plibersek and Anthony Albanese as the federal <laughs> members within my electorate. <laughs> Well done, Jamie. That's very good, Jamie. Is there anything you'd like to say about the way you see things working over the next three years? Well, I think Janelle really hit the nail on the head with a lot of these issues. Obviously, uh, you'll see in the chat that one very positive step forward is the Myanmar Campaign Network, which is a group of trade unions, faith organisations coordinated by AFIDA, put forward that score scorecard. And that was very important. Um, Labor mm. made some key commitments. The coalition's commitments were quite poor and the Greens made some further commitments. I spoke to Janet, I should say I'm a member of the Greens. I spoke to um, Janet Rice and obviously we want to try and work with Labor um, to move to that position of the third X that Labor has, but the tick that the Greens have, and that is acknowledging NUG as legitimate representatives of the people of Myanmar. That obviously needs to be done in a collaborative way. Um, obviously, the Greens have now got 12 senators in the federal parliament. Labor and Greens need to vote together if the coalition opposes something in order for it to pass and to become law. So there's some important steps we need to take. Our national conference is coming up in Melbourne in June over the long weekend. And we'll be, I'll be there in particular talking about Myanmar. And one of the key things we've been doing is engaging with the German foreign ministry as you know, the German foreign minister is a Green, uh, working strongly with our European fellow Greens um, MPs and ministers to try to see how we can work where we're strongest in the European Union to try to work with Senator Wong and the Australian government to bring Australia a little bit further towards the position of our allies in the EU rather than the position of um, countries that we are traditionally not aligned with. So. Um, that's very diplomatic, isn't it? So I think that there's some clear opportunities. Obviously, my key goal is to work within the Greens, but to focus on how we can collaborate and build the movement from the ground up. And I'm so pleased to hear about this office being established in Canberra. I had a discussion with Afida just about this issue last week. And one of the things that I think we need to do is make that office as welcomed as possible, give it as much legitimacy as possible, get federal MPs and others visiting that office and making sure that um, that commitment from the community to fund that office is something that's really effective and something that's really appreciated by the entire community. So mm -hmm. I think there's so much opportunity, isn't there? I think there's definitely a sense of some optimism and we need to be building on that carefully, methodically and strategically. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just one thing that you, when you mentioned the Czech Republic, and I should say this also for Janelle, uh, the connection that I see is less with the Czech Republic, except maybe on the bank account issue, but with the Council of the European Union. Mm. You can use that presidency to learn much more from the European Union about what they're doing and what we can do with them. That could be very beneficial. But I also think it's important that we find ways of working with China. If there's a country that's going to make a difference, it's China there. And I think uh, we are in a reasonably good position to do that. And I'd like to think about the readout we will all see over the next weeks about the, what's happened in the Pacific and what that means for Australia and China as well. Um, with the, uh, the, uh, the recognition of the NUG, the acknowledgement of the NUG, as Tintanu says in her note, 
as the legitimate representatives of the people of Myanmar, it's important for us to work out the best way of handling the respective roles of the CRPH and the NUG and how those things relate to one another. I'd like to think that we in AMI can help build the, the not the authority necessarily, but build the respect for the Australian oh, Parliament sorry, Daddy. as the representative. Daddy. Daddy. Daddy's there. The, the, oh, forgive me, everyone. <laughs> We can't even How see beautiful. It. I want to see her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, so uh, as we use our own parliamentary friends group in the federal parliament and perhaps associate that with similar sorts of groupings that might be formed in the Australian states, we should see that the role of the parliament as the partner to the CRPH is clear and the role of the government with the NUG is clear. The fact that the Australian government is going to put a charge into the embassy in Yangon is a good thing from this point of view as well. But there's a lot to work out on that and to see how it, re how it resolves itself. The military's reaction to the British doing something similar was a very negative one, but that's and perhaps because of the handling by the British of the affair themselves. Can I say that the um, SAC are... Uh, getting some of their ambassadors to go back, even the Australian one, I understand, and then they're going to redeploy them so they can be, <clears throat> um, they then want them credentialed by the respective governments to be able to say, well, the SAC has been accepted. So that's going on as well on their side at the moment. That's interesting. From my uh, background in, in foreign ministry protocol, the <laughs> idea that you would re-credential an existing ambassador is very strange. Well, like, no, they're, they're recalling them earlier and they will send others so that they, they're trying to call the governments on. I think that would be likely to have very, very poor consequences for them. I don't know who gives them their advice on these things, but we'll see. Well, you know, crystal balls, I don't know, but uh, Coco lying. <laughs> well, there's a, a strong back for you to rely on. I shouldn't laugh. It's terrible, <laughs> but yes, Coco lying. Um, <clears throat> I just thought I'd add that little tidbit that's going on with the SAC. Yes. Yes, well, we, and the references there were in, in what you said, I think it was, Tom Shui, about uh, uh, the ASEAN envoy, or the, the UN envoy, it was, wasn't it, rather than the ASEAN envoy. The ASEAN envoy says he's going to go back to Myanmar in June, and he's going to see, he says he's going to see everybody relevant. He doesn't say who that is, and he said something very similar before he went last time, and nothing much came of it. The Australian government's got to work out over these years ahead of us how to handle all these different interlocutors. And mm -hmm. I agree very much that we have to strengthen our relationship with the ASEANs to understand what they think they're doing and to give them the benefit of whatever advice we can put together. And I think we are in an unusual position in Australia in that we have a long history of trust and good relationship with the country at all sorts of levels. We've got to be able to use that. And, uh, I think, must. Yeah, and I think that uh, the DFAT people understand that quite well. Uh, whether they've been able, why they haven't been able to do a lot with it is, a, is an open question. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, the new minister, Penny Wong, will have a, a, a much easier understanding of how to make use of us in the time ahead. And we in AMI will be available for that at all times. We are going to have a discussion with them this week about the issue of getting humanitarian aid into the country, into the hands of the communities from where it's distributed, rather than through the army. So we will see how that works out as well. And we will try and keep people as, as well advised as we can about the way this all develops. Um, th there's a lot of other things happening in the country at the moment, of course, as usual. And it's difficult to know where to start with uh, looking at where the Australian government should be. The, we, we can never lose sight of the fact that one of the particular limitations on what we might want to do is the holding by the army of Sean Turnell. 
and that we are all very anxious to see what might happen about Sean Turnell. And there are always rumours that it's going to be happening soon, that something's in the air. But nothing has, of course, happened yet. But we'll see. I'm going to ask David Kamru a question because he's over there in the land of the European Union, the lands of the European Union. What do you know about the way the EU is handling Myanmar these days that might be of benefit to us? Um, the the interest is more at the level of the European Parliament. I mean, the the French Senate um, has suggested the uh, voted for the recognition of the NUG, for example. But uh, the major debates are occurring within the European Parliament, which have traditionally always been um, the the forum where human rights and you know, democratic issues are more strongly debated. Um, but it's not, to be frank, it's not a really a priority issue, you know, with the elections in France or, or you know, previously in, in Germany. Um, now that after the legislative elections in France, it may be possible to then come back and, uh, and talk about Myanmar again, but it's certainly not the case at the moment. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, been... go ahead. Go ahead. I, with the CRPH and some of the MPs, I've been engaged with the EU, and um, but with the European Parliament, David, with various groupings and meetings and so on, and looking at a meeting down to Thailand and different areas. So that continues, but that's with the CRPH, you know, with the MPs directly, and I'm usually involved in it in some way, so... I wanted to ask a, a question, really not about the European Union, but about the Philippines. Um, you know, there's a new president who will be inaugurated uh, soon in the Philippines, the son of a, the former dictator. And paradoxically, he will need to demonstrate his democratic cr credentials, at least that would be my objective uh, appreciation. H how, what do we know about interests in the Philippines in Myanmar, we've seen the Malaysians are pushing for recognition, well, more fully for recognition of the NUG and the engagement with the NUG. What do we know in the people who, in, in the audience and yourselves, about, you know, Myanmar in the Philippine context? Does anybody want to come forward with a response to that? Well... I just suggest, as Jamie Parker here, the people to speak to is the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights Group based in Bangkok. Janelle and I have both been involved in that group and they have very, very deep roots in ASEAN and they would be able to give a very detailed description of the position uh, of a whole range of different actors, including members of parliament post this election in terms of Myanmar. But it's something I think that most of us here aren't directly across, but they are very... Um, consistent and have established uh, international parliamentarians mm -hmm. for Myanmar group, uh, which I know Janelle and I are part of, and they yeah. would be able to answer that with um, with really good detail. They can, Jamie, but the Philippines are generally supportive of the democratic aspirations of the people of Myanmar, starting, you know, sometimes it's a bit whimsical, according to various presidents there. Um, this one, I think, will be straighter. And um, usually, yeah, pretty straightforward. They're not probably taken as seriously as Indonesia and Malaysia and some of the as other ASEAN members for whatever reason, but um, long-term supportive of the democratic aspirations. And the new president of the Philippines has said that he's going to follow the ruling it was reported as the International Court, but it's the Permanent Court of Arbitration on the issue of the South China Sea, <clears throat> just for interest. Yes, yes. And I've heard similar things about Bong Bong Marcos, that he's likely to remain aligned to the, if you like, the democratic forces. But what difference this will have for people in Napador, it's hard to, hard to predict. Uh, we have Muhammad Yunus. Are you still with us? I saw I saw Muhammad Yunus come mm -hmm. in. 
there's yes, his his name is there. Eunice, are you there? <laughs> Hello. It's Janelle calling. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you this, but you're there. Are you with us now? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I am here. Good. You're in Myanmar now, is that right? Yes, I am in Rangoon. What do people there have to say? What What do the Rohingya have to say about the current state of the, of the way the political parties, the NUG, and for that matter, the military, are relating to them right now? How do you see the future for the Rohingya people right now? Yeah, in the future, people are, you know, they're very eager to success the NUG because of the school now open, but the students are still waiting. You know, they, some students say they, they with NUG, they, they do not want to go to a school, something like that, because I am a teacher. So whenever I ask the students, what about you about the NUG? They are very much, you know, uh, support the NUG, even though they didn't want to go to a school until NUG take power. Uh, people are very, you know, also the, on the other hand, the military are doing their, you know, the very you know, electricity, water, everything is, you know, the lack of people's, uh, you know, vulnerable about that. Uh, so people are very eager to success the energy government, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we also have with us now Nicholas Koppel, who is the, uh, I was gonna say the previous ambassador, but he is still, he is the previous ambassador because we're about to put in a charge. Nicholas, what do you think is likely to happen in the next three years with the change of government in Australia? If you, if you can hear this question. Uh, yes, uh, we hope the Australian government, now the Labour Party, own the election. So people are very much, you know, uh, happy uh, to, to do some things uh, in the future. The Myanmar government, sorry, Myanmar, uh, coming the NUG government will support by, you know, the your Labour Party. Also, Labour Party did a lot of works for the democratic in Myanmar, uh, very previous day, now doing. So we hopefully the Labour Party will do uh, for the best of the Myanmar peoples to get democracy against and uh, support the energy government. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, Nicholas Koppel, are you with us? Yes, I am. Ah, good. What, what, what comment do you have to offer over the, about the three years ahead of us now that the government changed? Um, well, my, my sense is, and, and it is uh, an impression rather than something Formed by private conversations or any any particular uh, inside information, is that the uh, the Australia's foreign policy under Penny Wong will be not looking so much as punitive at punitive measures, but at um, looking at ways to uh, to build coalitions of support. Uh, I think they'll be working even harder with ASEAN, for example, to try and find pathways forward with Myanmar. So it'll. The, I think the tone may not look terribly different, um, but there'll probably be a, bit, a little bit more action. Uh, I would be surprised to see um, strong punitive measures against the regime, possibly the sanctioning of some of the senior military personnel um, as, a, as a gesture of the, you know, of, um, of you know, displeasure at the, at the, at the, the coup from 2001. Uh, 2021, but um, beyond that, I think it'll be looking at more constructive ways of engagement. Okay, thank you. But then my impressions. I, I um, thank, thanks very much. Prove to be to be wrong on that. I have a sense from talking to friends of mine in the parliament that the the, the people who are in the parliament now are going to be uh, more actively involved with their diaspora groups than what we've seen over the last few years. And this would be at the federal level, of course, but I think also state parliamentarians like you, Janelle, and you, Jamie, will be important to the way we take the community feelings from the diaspora groups forward. And so mm -hmm. what we will try to do through AMI is to link up to the people in state parliaments across the country 
And if Janelle, you or, or Jamie know any kind of forum among the state parliaments which might make this easier for us, that would be great. And we will see as soon as we can who gets uh, the, uh, the leadership jobs in the parliamentary friends group at the federal mm -hmm. parliament. Jamie and I can create one. Can you? <laughs> Across all the states, can you? No, I mean in New South Wales. No, in, no, do, do one which has got uh, people from got everywhere. Got a coalition <laughs> of <laughs> collaborators. Yeah, yeah. You've dobbed us in now, Janelle. We're going to have to actually do this now. We'll have we to can, try and consult our address books and find all the fellow travellers across Australia. Yep, yeah, we can do that. And I've got South Australia already. Um, Tung Nyo. Anyway, we can talk about that when we're in Parliament, Jamie. That would be good to put something together. Yes, I would, I would comment that um, I think having a, a group within this amongst Australian parliamentarians for to make communication easier is um, is a fine proposal. The, the, the bigger challenge is having um, coordination on, and bringing together the diaspora mm. because they are quite disparate and, um, and Well, there was a reference earlier, I think it was from, was it from you, Janelle, to the Myanmar Task Force? Yes. That doesn't exist yep. any longer, I'm sorry to have to say. It's been subsumed into the Myanmar branch or the, the Southeast Asia yeah. mainland branch in the department, yeah. as I understand it. It's been mainstream. It was there before. And so <laughs> it doesn't have the same sort of you know, good-looking legs as it, as it had earlier. We'll have to see what, what Penny Wong thinks about that. Maybe it's time on the back of the discussions we're having now to reform that kind of thing. Yep. And Konang Solzman, you're here. Are you still with yes, us? Sir. Yes, sir. I won't be um, this, uh, the opening the um, the camera. Is that okay? That's okay. Well, we're going to close very soon. But I thought that you might like to say something about your work and you are connected to the Myanmar Communications Network, the MCN, and AMI is, is kind of connected to that too. Yes. What do you see from your work for about diaspora connections to the people in government these days and for the future of that? That's right. It's, uh, this is what we see RPH and UG Support Group Australia's national team is planning. Uh, we're going to have a meeting with the DFAC at one o'clock tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to um, compare with the previous government and the uh, new government and the, what Penny Wong um, wanted to do with the human rights minister that she wants to appoint it. And also with the connection that we don't know with the uh, parliamentary friends of the Myanmar group in the, uh, uh, the Canberra uh, to possibly, I think so the Peter Kale is going to be a chair. I'm not quite sure we need to find out. And instead of the parliamentary friends of the Myanmar group, I think we need more active, uh, the, the, uh, the, what do you call it, action, I think from previous um, year, I don't think we have much um, a strong action from parliamentary friends of the Myanmar group. So that's what we're going to uh, discuss with the defect. Good, okay, thank you. Now there's a couple of other comments in the chat room. The MCN, this Myanmar Campaign Network is something which we will uh, Watch, we'll watch it grow and we'll have them make a presentation to this seminar in a month or two. The next seminar, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't uh, finalized this yet, but I'm hoping the next seminar can look at how the, uh, the Yangon Heritage Trust is functioning these days, if at all, and what it's doing to help protect the heritage at a time of military rape and pillage of the communities around them. So that discussion is going on now, and I hope we will be able to make that happen. But later on anyway, we will ask the MCN when they're ready to come and speak. And if we can get DFAT to come and speak about what they're doing, once Penny Wong has settled down, that'll be very good as well. <laughs> so let me say thank you very much for your attendance here now, uh, to all of you who are here and from all over the place. It's really good to see. And thank you to those who I bombed with questions as we went along. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody and thank you, Chris.